All right. Good morning, everybody. This is Scott Reed with Duck Sports Authority. I'm joined, as always, by Drew Davis. And today we have a special guest with us, Jordan Scott, former defensive tackle for Oregon, played through the 2020 season. He was a part of Willie Taggart's first class and stayed with Oregon. He just started his own podcast, and I kind of wanted to talk to him about that. But we'll start, Jordan, let's let's go back, because I know you have a really interesting story from when you first started playing football all the way up through how you got to Oregon. Let's see, kind of... When did you start playing, and how, what came up with how you got to Oregon? So, uh, started playing football when I was four years old. Um, started with a little league team, just playing center. Um, kind of just a little too aggressive for flag football, so that next year I got moved up. Um, and that's kind of how my story goes. Uh, started playing D-line that following year and moving into a league with no weight limit. And kind of from there, my career took off. I started being able to play in the games more. Obviously, it was kind of hard for me to make weight. Um, so I started playing more. And eventually, like, all the coaches would be like, yeah, I think uh, it's time for you to, like, move to high school. Obviously, they would love to have me in Little League still. But um, once I got to high school, I put that down and started playing football uh, high school. And then I played the first seven games of JV. Um, and just so happened, one of our players that started on varsity got in a fight in the game before. So kind of thrust me into a starting position with our team. And that year we went to the playoffs in the second round. Um, and I played every game after he got suspended as a starter and pretty much started the rest of my time in high school there. Um, picked up a bunch of offers, committed to Florida. Um, and I was an early enrollee and they kind of basically told me I was too fat, took a five-star kid over me from the Under Armour All-American game. And that kind of left me in limbo that December. But uh, just so happened, Coach Levitt and Coach Tagger end up meeting up at Oregon, two coaches who recruited me pretty hard, um, but knew that they probably didn't have a good chance at the schools they were at previously. But uh, as soon as they called me, I committed sight unseen, but I knew that I wanted, I mean, I always told my little league coach I wanted to go to Oregon, but I just never thought it would happen. I knew they barely recruit Florida, but um, I kind of felt like it was just a little bit of uh, destiny, if I will say, like Coach Taggart going to USF and then ending up at Oregon just in time for me to go there. So I decided to go sight unseen, and uh, everything played out exactly how I wanted it to. And uh, appreciate the Oregon community and all the coaches I had and Phil Knight and the training staff. It was just a great experience, man. And, so happy I made that decision. And I think that's the kind of the first time you probably faced any weird adversity was trying to overcome the fact that the Florida had basically pulled your offer at the last minute, right before early signing period, correct? Yeah. So uh, how that went, man, it was kind of like I committed like the end of my sophomore season. So I spent the whole season in some of my senior season committed to the Gators um, and when I committed, they basically told my mom, like, hey, you wouldn't let him go and have a night out in Miami just, like, visiting with girls before he says, I do at that uh, altar, would you? And that kind of, like, stuck with her. And basically, she made me not take no visits. And I told her they could say anything until I signed. So uh, it kind of hurt more to see her reaction than actually from the coaches because I knew I was still going to go to college. So it wasn't like, oh, my world is ending. But to see her crying and all the gear we bought and all that, it was it was real hard for me. Um, but that just shows the resilience and the and the drive I had that I was going to college no matter where. So I just had to find somewhere that was home for me. And that's kind of the first time you're tackling life, right? That's that time when you really have to tackle something that isn't right in front of you, that's not something easy that you can practice on. You just kind of have to react. Where do you think that, strength came from to make that kind of decision and not let it impact you and push you back a little bit or push you down? Uh, I think, and I was uh, telling the kids at the high school I coached at this yesterday, um, at an early age, I played with kids who were bigger than me and I played football for so long that all the lessons I learned coming up through football just something bad is going to happen. My, my high school football coach used to tell us before every game, like, something bad is going to happen in the game. Regardless if we win by 30 or we lose by 10, something bad happened in the game, and whoever responds the best is going to win. 
So I always, I always took that with me and ran with it. Like, hey, everything's not going to go your way. But either you're going to crumble or you're going to stand up and, and kind of find another avenue to get it done, what you need to be getting done. So uh, I think that's probably where that resiliency came from, just playing football and all the lessons I learned along the way. And then you get to Oregon, and of course you face adversity after the first season with Willie Taggart leaving, Mario Cristobal taking over. I know Jim Levitt stayed, so that helped a little bit with that transition. Was there any question when Taggart left whether you were going to stay or, or kind of make a different choice? Well, uh, for me, I was never going to leave because I was just – by the end, I was already bought in fully into being a duck, like, regardless. I mean – it depended on obviously who the head coach was going to be, but once we figured out that we could petition for Coach Mario Cristobal to be the coach, it was never going to be me leaving. Um, I think the 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 day that it happened was the most dramatic day in terms of for me because all of my friends who came in with me with Tiger was saying they going here and all these crazy places, and I'm like, this before the portal, so you got to go JUCO to go to a different college if unless you want to sit out of here. So I was like. I mean, I'm already a freshman All-American at this point, so whoever the coach is going to be, I'm going to play. So, I mean, that's kind of how I looked at it. Right. So, you, you go through your career at Oregon, you guys win a Rose Bowl, you graduate, you go on to the NFL, and then you have an off-season in- or you had an injury that kind of ended up ending your career, right? Uh, I guess, I mean, in, in the big scheme of things, yeah, I, I – I tore my meniscus probably about three weeks in the camp with the Vikings, but I was playing through it. And uh, after that game, when I caught an interception, man, I could barely walk. So I kind of like told the trainers, man, I think it's more serious than uh, just like a swelling or something. So uh, they looked at it and I had to get surgery, but I did play a year after that in the uh, USFL. Mm -hmm. And then pretty much when the USFL, merged with xfl my team got cut off and that kind of ended my career abruptly i got so you transitioned um first i hear you have twins is that true yep twin boys boys. are they up to two now are they a little over a year uh just a little over a year okay how's that working that's got to be a way adjustment right yeah man uh all the stories about parent people who've been parents telling me you know how how much it is and how much it really takes a toll on you and all of that. Like, I didn't really believe it until I had my own. And now I understand, like, it's a full-time job. Um, and especially through the night, like, when, when they're in the baby stage, not sleeping all the way through the night. Um, So, but it's fun, man. I can't wait till they get a little bit older so we can start running around outside and probably tackling each other and lifting weights <laughs> together and just doing stuff together that I, I would like to do when I was a kid with my kids. It's going to be fun. I can tell you from experience, it's a, it's a load of fun, um, especially, I say, enjoy that year, those years between about four and ten. Those are the perfect years. After they start getting to that pre-puberty and puberty age, you know, then some stuff starts to change. But the the transition then, now, I understand you're coaching now, correct? Yes. Where are you coaching at? Uh, local high school here in my city, uh, Boca Ciega. Okay. And are you just – doing football coaching and then doing other stuff kind of to make ends meet? What, what yeah, kind of work? So, uh, I, I sell insurance. Okay. And uh, I'm doing the coaching thing, man, just trying to find something outside of football that I enjoy and kind of keep me afloat and keep me comfortable. So then where the idea for the, the podcast come from, Tackling Life? Because I really like the concept of it. As I was telling Drew, and I think I told you before we got on, the concept of we have we have gaps to fill after we give up sports. Now you don't know this, but I played at a smaller school before I transferred to Oregon. Um, I played at Eastern Oregon. I tore up my ankle. I said, "Well, if I'm not going to play, I'm going to Oregon." And I get there, I have to fill a gap. I have this gap of all that time I spent playing football, right? And I filled it with powerlifting. But then I had to retire from that after 30 years of it, and you've, you've got these gaps filled. So, kind of happened to prod you into doing this tackling life podcast. Uh oh, we lost connection. I think. Ah, oh, there he is. Can you hear me? I got you. All right. So I think with the podcast, the biggest thing was like during COVID, 
So this has been the idea me and my friends had, had during COVID. Uh, we just kind of liked how Brandon Marshall and the I Am Athlete guys hopped on and did it. And at that time, I was still like chasing NFL. So I was watching uh, Nightcap, and I Shannon had said like, if you want to start a podcast, the best thing you can do is just jump out there. The longer you wait and try to hope that you know you can be perfect on your first episode is the the longer it's going to take for you to even get started. So that's kind of what just threw me out there. And that's why my first episode is kind of like just me in front of my computer talking. Uh, Drew, Drew can attest to that as well, because I started this. Uh, I just took over the site, the publisher of the Duck Sports Story Rival site in August. And we hadn't been doing a podcast before. I had mentioned it to the prior publisher and it kind of got pushed out. And I did the same thing. I just jumped in. Uh, and then after a couple of weeks, I'm like, oh, I need to add this to it. And I need to add that. And I need to, you can see my fancy studios, which aren't really studios. That's a nice virtual background. But I just thought there's things that we need to add, but I don't want to just try to make it perfect first because that could take me months before it's perfect. So I think that's a really good approach. Do you, I know, I know you're going to talk football on it, are you, but the tackling life part is the part I really like. Just kind of talk about how you're going to incorporate that part into your football conversation. Yeah, so I kind of look at the tackling life as the brand of of what I'm doing. Um, so obviously, uh, like I said at the end of that episode, it's going to be more than just you know the episodes where I have somebody come on and we talk ball and we talk life story and how football or even whatever sport they play intertwines with their life and some of the key lessons they learn through their sport. But uh, there's going to be another kind of like faction of tackling life where we call tackling takes. Um, and that's going to be with me and my friend. We just shot the first episode last night. Um, so I'm trying to see, you know, how how I want to go about that. But in terms of the tackling life, I look at that as the brand. So it'll be sometimes it'll be an episode like tackling life where I say we'll have a guest on talking about their life experiences and how their sport intertwined and the key lessons. And then uh, sometimes it'll be me and, and my co-host. Uh, on the tackling takes, you know, talking about talking more specifically about sports and maybe a little bit of uh, like who's on the hot seat type stuff. So just yeah. kind of more of a the tackling life is the brand. And that's when we we bring on people and we talk the stories and then more of the uh, the tackling takes will be kind of specifically focused on sports and uh, maybe a little bit of life story in there, but mostly just want to go through some sports and stuff on there. OK. Drew, I'm going to let you jump in and see if you've got any questions, things you guys want to talk about since you have a shared experience a little bit with different coaches, but a lot of shared experience there. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Jordan, I just want to say, man, I uh, appreciate your resilience on pushing through stuff, man, uh, being able to stick it out uh, when you got your scholarship offer pulled, when you were at Oregon, switched between coaches, like a whole bunch of that stuff, dealing with uh, torn meniscus that you're playing through and catching interceptions as a 300-plus pound lineman. Um, uh, just tell me, what is what is one of the things you enjoyed uh, just in the NFL uh, for your time there? I think the biggest thing I enjoyed in the NFL, man, and, and I think a lot of people, uh, you know, dream about it, but it's everything you dream it is, man. It's, it's the highest level competition. Like, in college, it's kind of like, hey, you know you might be better than the guy that's the starting old lineman, so you're not going to have a hard practice just based off that. Uh, I think in, in the NFL, like there's nowhere else to go. So even if they're not that good, you just feel like confident after practice. You have a good one. It's like, man, that was a good practice by me. Like, and it's the same in college a little bit, but it's, it, the difference is, you know, this is the highest level. So even though this guy might be not the best, he's still the best thing we got to offer. And I had a great day of practice. Not every day you're going to have a great one, but when you do, you know how you feel after. And especially in the meetings with the coaches, like, uh, I think, the biggest thing I, I really enjoyed was that competition piece. Like, obviously, in college, it's competition. But, you know, when you're in the NFL, um, the coaches and everybody is based on production. So, it's nobody going to be playing favorites. Like, if you didn't have a great day, the coach is going to put you on blast. Nobody's a, a sacred duck, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
A hundred percent, man. I uh, so I played in Oregon 07 to 11, played for the Atlanta Falcons uh, 11 to 15, and then got into coaching after that. So I know exactly what you mean. And just being at practice, uh, being a guy I was undrafted. Um, so being one of those undrafted guys where you're sitting at practice and if you drop a ball and you make a mistake, you're like, man, is this, this going to be my last practice? Are they going to cut me? Am I going am I going to be able to suit up and be active this week? You just never know. Um, I just think it's awesome, though, that uh, you being from Florida, you always said you wanted to go to Oregon. Uh, what attracted you to Oregon? Like, I know you said, hey, I wanted to go to Oregon, but I know they didn't recruit Florida. What made Oregon attractive to you even before you got an offer from them? Uh, I think just obviously the flash like my junior year was the year they went to the championship so i remember the day that that we, i had with my friends we all went to wing house um i remember telling them like man there's nowhere else you could get these kind of jerseys like in in the scheme chip kelly we got deanthony thomas and michael james like just the whole uh whirlwind of all the stuff that was going on at that time kind of reeled me in and uh I mean, DeForest Buckner, Armstead, uh, I forgot the linebacker name, but it was just so many good players at the time where, you know, uh, obviously I'm in Florida, so I'm just getting bashed in the head with SEC, but I, I really took a liking to the, the, the Ducks and especially Mariota and Michael James. Like everybody where I live wanted to wear number six and number 21 because of those guys. So I thought, you know, where else would I want to go in the place with the best jerseys, best facilities? Um, and clearly worked out for me, man. I just wish I could have stayed healthy, um, but you know, can't get it back. I got you 100%. Well, I appreciate you, man. And I definitely think you can add your name to one of them great defensive linemen or some of those great defensive players you named. And I just remember watching you and I would be watching games. I'm like, man, that boy big and he can move. So kudos to you, my dude, for being a, just an excellent athlete. Appreciate and it, even being and, and being able to play uh, beyond college because it's a very small percent of people that can do that. And no matter how much time you spend in the league, man, it is a blessing to even tell people that you were able to do that because it takes hard work and it takes talent. So I appreciate you, bro. Yeah, man, I got a question for you. Um, I know you said you played – 2011 to 15, right? Correct. So uh, and then it, Go ahead. No, I said correct. You're correct. Okay. And then, so what do you think the biggest difference is from the Natty team and then the other teams you played on? Man, uh, I guess, you know, like you talked about Coach Kelly and, and we were uh, in our second year under him as head coach. Um, so that national championship team, man, it was it was made up of guys. We weren't the most talented, uh, but we were the most cohesive unit. You know, I, I remember us spending time on the weekends together. The good thing, and you know, about being in Eugene is everybody just doesn't shoot home and, and go home on the weekend or, you know, everybody's not just in Vegas. Like you usually spend that time in Eugene and we were a real close knit team. And I think coming off of a Rose Bowl birth, the, like you said, the first one since 95, I think we kind of knew we had something special on that team. And so I think everybody was was all in as far as like showing up for the summer workouts with Coach Rad, um, just being where we were supposed to be. We were real disciplined in just everything we did. And I just think we just we had a selfless group where I think a lot of people wanted to ball. People wanted to put up numbers. But I think they were also like, man, as long as we get the W at the end of the day, that's what matters. And in order to go to a championship game and to play great teams and to win, you need a lot of selfless people who don't care who gets any um, who gets the credit for the work as long as everybody's putting in. OK, my other question would be, uh, so you was on the team with Mariota. And I played with Herbert. Um, I think, like, I, I would like to think of Herbert. I mean, uh, Mariota is more a vocal leader, and Herbert was more like lead, lead by example. Like, was that true? Do you think Marcus was vocal? Or, I mean, I don't know. You don't really know how Herbert was, but just to seeing all the videos and how much the team loved him, like, I think that vocal leadership from uh, Mariota was there. I, I, I would assume, right? Yeah, so no problem. So I played. So Mariota came the year after I left. So I was at I was at Oregon 07 to 11. And then oh, I played okay. in the league 11 to 15. No problem. But I know both of those guys. And I think what you said is right, though. Like, you know, I, I remember the knock on both of them coming out into the NFL was that they were like, oh, these guys aren't vocal. Can they lead an offense? Can they can they can they be in the huddle and, and galvanize a team? 
Um, but I think that's when you look at Oregon players over their history, you've never really seen like a, a super outwardly boastful, like, you know, quarterback at Oregon. You had the Jeremiah Masolis, you had the Dennis Dixon, you had the Darren Thomas, and you can go on and on and on down the line. Um, but I just think there's a certain mold for an Oregon quarterback. And I just think also just there's been other great players that are around them that allow them to do what they do. Um, just knowing that I know I know Justin a little bit and I talked to him here and there, uh, but him being a guy that's from Oregon, born and raised in Eugene and and him growing up and watching Ducks and watching Ducks football uh, plays a major role in just his approach and his pride that he has for Oregon. So um, that's pretty much what I can say about that. I know I know Marcus is also a little bit more vocal, but I think both of those guys are just quiet leaders who other people respect because they show up and do the right things. Yeah, man, and Herbert, I come in the weight room, and his his lift was before mine, and I see him power clean at three fifteen, and I'm like, bro, I have never, I never did that much, so I'm like, I gotta get on my stuff. Like this dude six seven power clean three fifteen and doing it with perfect form, like ass to ankles. So I think you know, and people don't really understand like that kind of leadership versus the vocal. Everybody want that rah rah guy, but I do think that's kind of true about the temperament even Bo Nix and uh Dylan Gabriel kind of have that same temperament where the team respects them but they're not like yelling and screaming at guys like that's just not the personality so that's cool good questions good questions brother your your quarter your linebacker by the way was Michael Clay I believe is the one you were referencing on that championship team okay that's it was Michael Clay and Casey Matthews were the two linebackers on that team that stood out I, and I agree with you, the vocal leadership sometimes is overplayed. I, Marcus had to grow into it. Marcus wasn't a natural vocal leader. He was a red shirt during your senior year, Drew. And I don't. we heard reports early during that red shirt year that something special was going to co come the next year. He had to grow into it. He wasn't, he wasn't born vocal. He was, he's a Hawaiian kid, real quiet, real, sh I don't want to say shy, but just kind of quiet and does his thing that he's supposed to do and works hard. And I think Justin was the same way. Just go in and work hard. Go in and, and put in the effort and people will follow. If you put in the effort and you show results with your effort, people will follow. I think sometimes we overplay vocal leadership. And I know national media does. They try to talk. Justin doesn't lead. Justin doesn't do this. He leads with his work and his play. And that's all you need to lead with. So I think that's a great discussion. Uh, you guys want to move on to kind of talk quick about the Purdue shutout? Yeah, let's man. do it. All right, let's go. So it was, a, it was a, obviously a shutout. I think I saw something that, you know, they came out with a purpose for the first three drives. It was very clear after that 99-plus yard drive that they could do anything they wanted offensively. But it also seemed pretty clear they wanted to get Jordan James some rest. They wanted to kind of get keep people fresh as we head into the, the next stretch of the season where you've got Illinois this week, Michigan the following week, and then Maryland at home before you get that bye week. And I think that's what I saw was a really – a team that could, knew they could do what they needed to do and then kind of took it to the point where they said, we don't need to, the new era, we don't need to win every game by 50 points anymore. We need to, we need to win games, get to the championship, get to the playoffs. Stay healthy. Kind of, what did you guys see? Uh, I'll go first. Uh, I played, when I played, man, we wanted a shutout so bad. And people don't realize, no matter if you're playing South Dakota State or Nebraska, like getting a shutout is hard to do, bro. It's a full 48 minutes of football with no touchdown or no points from another team at all. Like basically got to keep them from crossing the 45. Like, so I thought like the intention and focus from both sides of the ball, because, you know, sometimes the defense trying to pitch a shutout, but the offense trying to put up a bunch of points, like you said, and that kind of can hurt the shutout. But I think they went in, like even the coaches went into this game, like we're going to get a shutout. Like we're not gonna call a bunch of passes at the end and give them a garbage time touchdown. Like we wanna we wanna leave here with Purdue with a donut on the scoreboard. And I think when, you know, like you said, the, the whole staff is on the same page. That's that's what can happen with this team, man. A lot of people not really watching our games, just looking at the box score. But at the end of the day, man, when you can hold another team for forty eight minutes to no points, you got something special on your hands. Mm. I agree. A local, I'm going to jump in real quick. A local writer tried to denigrate the win, saying it wasn't a great win. And I, I wrote a column on Sunday morning and I basically said, anytime you can shut out a conference opponent, that's a great win. That is tough to do. Oregon hadn't shut out a conference opponent in 30 years. And the last one was, was Oregon State, seven to nothing. So that's, 
that's how difficult that is. And I think there should be a lot of praise for that kind of effort to, to shut out a conference opponent. I, Purdue may not be the best team in the world this year, but it's tough to shut people out. They scored. I bet they score at least three points on everybody else they play. They scored 46 points against Illinois in the second half of the game the prior week. They can score exactly. points. So they're a tough team. I think I was impressed by that. And what I was really impressed by wasn't that the starters were able to keep them shut down. It's when you saw Terrence Green come in and Amari Washington come in. You saw these guys that are second string, third string come in and still continue to make tackles in the backfield. Really, really impressive effort all around on the defense. Yeah, 100 percent. I would agree with you. And that's what I was going to say and come in in second. Like, we're not just talking about the ones playing for 60 minutes. We're talking about the twos and threes that came in, knew what was on the line, did what they had to do. And they just the defense did an awesome job. It's the defense doesn't get enough credit just because, like Jordan said, shutouts are hard to come by. Like, you mean to tell me they don't cross a certain point on the field and can't get any points on the board? But more so than that, the the there wasn't any letdown from the previous week. You know, we hear about that all the times with teams who had a big win, a top ranked win, a top five win against a team, and then they come out the next week and then they lay an egg. Um, but I also agree with what you guys said. They're trying to we're trying to make sure we're healthy throughout the year. We're not sitting here trying to score 50, 60 points and make sure we're leading the nation in scoring points and making sure Dylan Gabriel's number one in the Heisman race. We got our mind on the bigger picture. And I think that shows growth in coaching and also just with players, knowing that in my in my experience players always used to get hurt on like the most bs play you could imagine it's not the game against ohio state and fourth and one going here it's the second play of the game versus north dakota state where you roll your ankle or something like that so i'm glad they can get healthy i'm glad these guys can on a short week also and then and then also just get more rest going into next week which is a formidable opponent as well yeah and one more thing before we go uh I mean, just think about it, man. Any level of football, people score at least once a game. Like it's it's just too hard to get a shutout. So, uh, and I'm probably sure they probably not used to Oregon getting shutouts because that's not what we really known for as defense. But you got to think about it, man. Forty eight minutes, no field goals, no touchdowns. Like I'm sure it was a point in the game where they probably got kind of past the fifty, and it, and the team like had to tighten up. So. Just got to know, bro, like people who really know football know that you, no matter if you're playing, like I said, South Dakota State and Nebraska, holding people to zero points is hard. It is very difficult. So, and that's a good transition. We'll head to talk about Illinois real quick. The one thing that I'm going to say about Illinois that is going to be different, they're going to blitz. And if Dylan Gabriel has struggled at any point this year, it's been when he's faced five and six man rushes. He's made, he's, I think I saw a QBR of 54 versus a 132 when he's not blitz. So there's a significant difference when he's blitz. They're going to blitz. Do I think they have the personnel to hang with Oregon for 60 minutes? I don't. I think Oregon's going to be better at them at just about every position. And Oregon's going to be able to run the ball. They, Illinois, despite being a Brett Bielema team, does not have a great run defense right now. Their run defense is, I think they're, you know, Sacks adjusted yards are 155 per game, 4.8 per carry. That's not a Brett Bielema type team. He's used to seeing 3.1 a carry after sack adjusted. But Oregon is going to be able to do things. If they blitz, I think Oregon is going to be able to make a pay. I think Dylan Gabriel is not going to have the same problems he had against Boise State. If they blitz five and six guys, he's going to hit these guys. He's going to hit Kenyon Steak short, or if Terrence Ferguson is back, he'll hit him in the short stuff. And then he'll be able to get over the top. I, I just don't know that they have the defensive backfield to really stop this. They play a lot of man coverage, and that's dangerous against Evan Stewart, Tez Johnson, if Trayshawn Holden's back. Uh, those, there's so much, there's so many weapons that I just don't know that Illinois can hold them down for 60 minutes. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, I like your take. I think people um, people overrate those stats a little bit. Because think about it, four of those games was the beginning of the season. They probably just now getting into the swing of the season. Like after Ohio State, that's when the full we're fully comfortable. We know. I know if I throw the ball here, you'll get there. I know when you when you do this release, I know where to put the ball on this shoulder. So I think uh, those stats get better over time. As you can see, like he's not he's not the same quarterback he was. We won. 
and the offensive line is a lot better. Um, and and just to do the uh, same of like this, then they just play the same team. So both teams just that's what I'm saying. Just to do the uh, same opponent, just looking at how that game went, I don't think there'll be a problem. Obviously, like you said, though, you got to always be aware of the the getting too high on your own supply. Basically, you can't you can't be buying into the stuff in the media. So. Uh, I like how Coach Landon is approaching being number one, even though that's a huge accomplishment for him deep down inside. He knows, like, that doesn't mean anything if we don't win the Natty. So that's kind of the approach I hope that they have for the rest of the season. Like, we know we're good, but we can't we can't play down the teams that aren't on our level. I mean, number one doesn't mean anything until the last game is played. It's just a number. Drew, exactly. was, on a, ranked, Drew was on a team that was ranked number one for seven consecutive weeks, and they – Probably were the best team, if not for a couple of just unlucky, unfortunate plays. If Michael James scores down in the red zone from the one, if they get down Michael Dyer, and I'll, we won't discuss whether he was actually down or not, uh, if those things are the difference, and the rankings are fun for us, they're fun for fans, they're fun for people to talk about, they're fun for media, because it's what we do. We talk about things when there's nothing to talk about, but... I think Dan Lanning has done such an impressive job this year. The growth I've seen in him as a coach year over year has been really impressive from last year to this year. It's, he's different this year than he was a year ago, and I'm I'm impressed with the way he's approaching it this week. Would I like to have access to practice? Sure. Is it necessary for him? No, it's probably counterproductive for him, and I, I'm glad that he closed it this week. Mm. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this matchup. Um, like you said, you got Illinois who blitzes a lot. I've been – uh, lucky enough to watch them a couple times this year and just looking at them on offense, you know, any team that's coached by Brett Bielema, they're going to be real efficient. Now, they're not efficient as they would normally be with the Brett Bielema team who's been coaching them for three, four or five years. Um, but you look at Luke Alkmeyer and he's 15 touchdowns, one interception. He has an all star receiver and Pat Bryant that he throws to. So I think this is another good, solid test for Oregon as far as being able to sort out stuff up front, figuring out who's blitzing. But I like I said, I really I'm a fan of Will Stein. He does a tremendous job getting us into screens, getting people the ball out in space, making sure your eyes are in the right place. And if they're not, then you're in trouble. And so I think this is a real good game. I'm glad we have this game at home like it's one versus 20. Um, but you look at, you know, like Jordan said, you look at the matchups. They played Purdue. Um, and it was 50 to 49. Granted, Purdue had fired their offensive of coordinator, so they came in doing something different. But I'm a fan of winning. And anytime you win, you get points from me. And so just knowing that they come in at six and one, uh, they lost to Penn State by 14 a couple weeks ago. Uh, they beat Nebraska. So they have some pretty good res stuff on their resume as far as teams that they've played. And so you can't take them lightly when they come in. So these are the types of team that if they don't make any mistakes and they hold on to the ball and they keep time of possession, um, it'll make for a good game. Now, the spread is, I think, 20 or 21 right now. And Ridiculous. so that's very – that's <laughs> and so that's very <laughs> – I didn't so want to say that because I've seen I, – the funny thing about gambling, bro, when I played, I really didn't even know the spreads on the games. Like, <laughs> And I don't know how it was so oblivious – but now, like, every week, the spread is just getting crazy. I'm like, I, I respect us, and I love us as a team, bro, but just why we got to go so crazy, Vegas? <laughs> <laughs> because that's how they get people to spend the money in Vegas. Yep. All right, you guys, anything else you want to talk about today? I, I'm excited to see this game this weekend. I'll be up in the press box again, so do my normal stuff. Anything else you guys want to talk about about this game? Uh, I mean, I just – I don't have anything to say. I just thought I was watching the, the Manning cast and Bill Belichick came on, and he was talking about, like, what makes uh, a team good. And I think we got all three of the things he said. He said you got to be able to stop the run, run the ball, and tackle on special teams. And right now we're doing all those three things at a high level. So, like uh, – and he was talking about, like, all the new stuff, coaches coming in with all these new – like philosophies and schemes, but he said, like uh, Bill Walsh told him, like if you can't tackle and stop the run, and I mean tackle on special teams, stop the run and run the ball, you won't win. And I think that's what we're doing good right now, just stopping the run, running the ball, and, and tackling on special teams. Obviously, our special teams has been a good uh, spot in our team as well this year. So, I, I, like you said, you can see the evolution of Coach Landon. Like 
just taking over the team in full. So I, I think we do keep doing those three things week to week, man. We'll end up where we want to be. Perfect. I agree. Hey, Jordan, I really want to thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm excited about your continuing pod. I'm, I'm looking forward to each episode. Drew, always a pleasure to talk to you. We will chat again next week following this game. And I will put this out probably tomorrow. i got to make sure I edit out a couple of things at the beginning uh, before the intro starts. There's always some stuff I have to edit out. So this will be up tomorrow. And I will have a shout out to everybody else. Go ahead and tag you, Jordan, so that you can shoot it to your followers and let them follow. Re hear what we had to say today. Okay. I got a few questions for you. So how you how you doing the uh, virtual background? Is this like through Zoom or is it through the StreamYard? It is through StreamYard. It is an option that you have in the settings. Um, if you want to do a virtual background, so when you do virtual backgrounds, the thing that happens with them is you have what they call a, a crop out of your hair, the top of your head, and, and it's especially prevalent unless you have something behind you that is a solid color screen. So I use a green screen behind me. And then I created this one. I had this one created virtually for me because I liked the look of it. I wanted it to look modern. I wanted it to look like a, a studio and not just uh, a man cave or anything like that. So I created that as a picture. I uploaded it to StreamYard and I use that as my virtual background. I have a green screen behind me so that my movements aren't quite as, you can see what happens if you move too much. You can see that blurring effect. So I try to limit the, that by having the green screen behind me and then just run with it and let them do the, you know, you have to make sure your hardware acceleration is set properly on your computer. You can't do a virtual background through StreamYard on your phone because your phone doesn't have a good enough graphics card to run the hardware acceleration to allow the virtual background. So I had to do okay. a couple of special things last night. I had to create a webcam out of my tablet, which I did using an app that you can put on your tablet and your computer where basically the computer looks at your tablet as if it's a webcam, not as if it's a tablet. So that allows me to have a tablet running my camera while I then run the rest of it off my computer. Okay, and then for like the graphics and editing, is it like a platform you're using for that stuff? StreamYard does it. The This part you see up in the corner where you see the Flock Costa podcast, if you are hosting your own StreamYard pod, you'll see that it comes with a generic looking thing. I found a website, one that I can get it to you, where the guy basically showed how to take the, the existing overlay, it's called an overlay, and adapt it to your own needs. And then you had to figure, figure out the hex colors for green and yellow, for Oregon green and yellow, and then kind of plug those into this. But it's there. And this guy's pretty good at showing you how to do it. And it's all available on StreamYard as a option for you to put these kind of graphics in there. The background image, you may not recognize that behind my studio is a background image of the Oregon weight room. If you don't recognize that, that's what that is in the very background. The That's just a background image that I like better than having a blank screen before I had the studio thing put up. So these are all things that I kind of just learned as I was trying to, in a lot of Google searches, a lot of Google okay. searches trying to figure out the next thing to do to improve my my look. Thank you, because I'm a uh, I'm only on my second episode. I'm, I'm I didn't even edit the first one at all. Uh, we trying to edit this one I just shot last night, so I'm just trying to learn a little bit more about the podcast game. So appreciate that. Yeah, anytime. And I use obviously YouTube for the edit because I only have to edit out usually a couple of seconds at the beginning where there's a, a lap between where we're we're having a chat before my intro runs that captures on that. So I'll edit that part out just so that it literally when this goes up on the air, it'll be the intro starts off the whole thing and you, it'll, it'll look like a smooth transition to everything. Fortunately, I don't have a ton of edits that I have to do at the back end. I don't seem to have too many problems with, with people with dead space. I had one on the first episode, somebody edited it out for me. I try to keep the dead space out. And then at the end, if there's any dead space at the end, like when I'm hitting my end recording button, I'll edit that out. It's usually only about 10 seconds of dead space. So those things work pretty easily on YouTube because you can edit up to a minute out. If you have a lot of edits to do, there's better programs than YouTube. Okay. Thank you, man. Appreciate right. you bringing me on. Hey, you're welcome back anytime. If you want to chat, just let us know. We'll, we'll bring you on. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jordan. All right, guys. Have a